We're going to get started in just a moment. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We are very excited to welcome so many of you here into this Zoom space with us. Um, because of some bandwidth and security issues, all participants have had uh, your audio muted and your video is disabled. If you do have a technical problem or a question during the event, you can use the chat to get a hold of our technical team and they can answer questions for you. So a huge, huge thank you to the librarians and archivists with Palestine Steering Committee, our membership at large, and everyone that was involved in putting this event together today. Thank you so very much. Um, a bit about librarians and archivists with Palestine. We are a network of self-defined librarians, archivists, and information workers in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. Our network consists of individual members, a steering committee, and an advisory board. And you can find more about us on our website at librarianswithpalestine.org and by following us on our social media channels. Uh, my name is Dee Roberts, and I am a graduate of the Master of Arts Theology program at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary as well as the Interreligious Engagement Master of Divinity track at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. And I am a librarian, and I currently work as the reference and outreach librarian at Pitt's Theology Library Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So in addition to being a member of LAP, I am also on the steering committee of the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA, I am part of the Institute for the Critical Study of Zionism, and I'm also helping to implement a brand new initiative called the Institute for the Study of Christian Zionism. And it is such a gift for me to be here moderating this conversation. So without any further ado, please welcome our two guests with us today. We have Dr. Rashid Khalidi, who is a Palestinian American, and he is the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies and was one of the founders of the Center for Palestinian Studies at Columbia University in the city of New York. He received his BA from Yale University and his doctorate from Oxford University and is the co-editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies. He was previously the president of the Middle East Studies Association and an advisor to the Palestinian delegation to the Madrid and Washington Arab-Israeli peace negotiations from October 1991 until June of 1993. Khalidi is the author of several books and many journal articles and op-eds, and his most recent book, a New York Times bestseller, is The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017. A graduate of Oberlin College, Sim Kern is a queer and Jewish Gulf Coast author and environmental journalist writing about climate change, queer identity, and social justice. Their novel, The Free People's Village, published by Levine Curiodo, has risen to the USA bestsellers list as the official Indie Next selection. Publishers Weekly describes Kern as, quote, a master at creating words that feel vast and lived in with very few words that will wow any reader of speculative fiction, unquote. In recent years, Sim has established a large following on both book talk and bookstagram, 
becoming a leading voice in the struggle for justice. Earlier in 2023, they facilitated a trans rights readathon that collectively raised over $200,000 for trans supporting organizations. So thank you both so much for your time today and for being here. Um, we will get into some questions. So at the top, uh, one of the biggest battles that we have fought is over the struggle to fight back against the single story narrative that has dominated mainstream Western media, that the Jewish people landed in Palestine to create a country for a people without a land and a land without a people. Thematically woven into the book, it is important to recognize that the Palestinian society was vibrant for centuries prior to the British mandate period. And presently, the eyewitness accounts of Palestinians in Gaza risking them and their families' lives have brought a human image to viewers through apps like Instagram and TikTok. So we've seen how social media can be a powerful force in changing people's minds and pushing back against the dominant narrative present in Western media. So first question, what do each of you consider to be the most important practice that people can employ to combat disinformation and work to center the Palestinian narrative? It's a great question. Sam, you want to take that first, or should I? Go ahead. Go ahead. You go. <laughs> you go first. I mean, it, 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 first of all, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm so pleased to to be here um, with all of you. Um, I guess you know it's a it's sort of a trite response, but inform yourselves more. Um, part of the problem with that single narrative that you mentioned, uh, D being so prevalent is that people just don't know better. Um, and it was true until very recently that it wasn't possible to learn a great deal about the Palestinian narrative. And there now are means to do that. Um, it doesn't just mean reading, you know, histories or watching, uh, watching stuff that you can see on social media. It also can mean looking at literature and looking at poetry and looking at things that, you know, reveal the lived experience of an entire people. And that are now accessible in English to people who are interested. And uh, you know, I, I, I obviously am a historian. I'd love for people to read history, but it, there are so many ways today that people can get access to that that other other narrative that was just so invisible for so long. Um, and uh, it, one of the things that I, I try and do, and that I think people should be trying to do, is to give people access to those kinds of resources. Yeah, I'm just completely in concurrence. You know, uh, the, what I did on October 7th was put out a list of Palestinian, like books by Palestinian authors that have been really transformative to me because I knew the onslaught of propaganda we were about to receive. And, the, and again, the amount of disinformation. And one of the best ways to, you know, I don't think, you know, you asked about how do we combat disinformation? I have no idea how to stop disinformation, but we can like, train people to be able to see through it and to be able to question well, maybe we should question what Israel is putting out on like state media and why should we question like CNN headlines and so um, I think that reading books that center the Palestinian experience uh, is really a powerful way to do that um, so that that's kind of where I started off uh, on this journey and then um, just really found Khalidi's book to be like a fantastic resource for just this really comprehensive history that having read it, you know, it's just, you're not, you're not going to be fooled by the same sorts of narratives and the, you know, Zionist talking points that are endlessly repeated in, in comments and stuff. They're not going to trip you up if you have all that history to, to call upon. Um, yeah. And I, I was actually struck, I wanted to talk to you about the conclusion of your book last night, because it was kind of surreal reading it um, and thinking about, you know, cause you're talking about God forbid some, uh, an ethnic cleansing actually happens. And it feels like we're seeing like this, this worst nightmare that you were being, you did say in the conclusion, you know, it does seem like that it, it's more possible now than at any point in history since 1948, that this could happen. Um, you were talking about like, there's three sort of different tactics to 
um, telling the Palestinian story. And one is to focus on um, uh, the, oh shoot. Okay, so, but the most powerful one you said was to focus on like the inequality um, of, you know, exposing people to the idea of apartheid, um, you know, revealing the colonial nature. Maybe you remember all three. <laughs> but it, it really struck with me that you, when you said uh that you know the u.s isn't necessarily primed to see the inequality and to see the horror of settler, settler colonialism because we haven't really reckoned with that in our own history you know i think like even many people on the left or like more progressive liberals are starting to you know uh, do that work I, and i'm and Obviously, like communities of color have, have been experiencing this and processing it for a long time, but um, that 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 was really uh, I don't know, just insightful for me and like helped me articulate this idea of why freeing Palestine does feel extremely personal as a as a U.S. Jew, you know, and and how freeing Palestine is really going to mean freeing ourselves. So okay. all I found all that very helpful. I mean, I think the equality thing is absolutely central. I, I, I don't see a solution that doesn't, there is no solution. There is no resolution that doesn't involve complete equality. And there are all kinds of ways to get there. And I don't know the way, I mean, I'm not a you know crystal ball reader. I can't tell you what the future might be or should be, but well, should be, I can tell you, it should be a future of absolute equality and equal rights. Now, how you get there, I have no idea from this reality. The other thing that you said, I would just stress again and again, we live in a country where settler colonialism is, is normalized. We don't realize, we, except for Native Americans and people who were brought here as slaves, we're all settlers. All of us are settlers. No, we're not a nation of immigrants. We're a nation of settlers. And that being normalized here, it makes it a little easier for Israeli propaganda to make it seem like, oh, that's not such a bad thing, you know, the frontier and so on and so forth. So I, I think the central thing is, is has to be equality and justice. But I think that winkling out the, the, the degree to which we are complicit because we are like them, as it were, and how that should make us reflect about this country um, speaks to what you just said, said, that, you know, this is something about us too, us as Americans. Yeah, I think that there is a comedian that said that, you know, if the United States is going to recognize that in Palestine, that means we have to give back a country to the indigenous people in, in this land as well. And so I think that that uh, personally for me, that narrative um, shifting that within the United States has been uh, a long journey. And I think it's still ongoing I think in the conclusion you really brought home the fact that some of these things are there's some short-term you know initial things that we can do now in in the instant a lot of this work is you know decades and and generational building to really yeah. change people's minds throughout time and space it's easier with young people I gotta tell you um older people tend to be more fixed in their ways. And you see that in every, every poll, that the people who are the most open are people who are more flexible in their thinking. That tends to be younger people and people who have access to sources of information that people who are locked into mainstream corporate media just don't have. Yeah, there were, there were some questions from our um, attendees on social media asking about, um, you know, Rashid, do you have any tips or helpful strategies, especially for young Palestinians in the diaspora to kind of like get through all of these things? What, what would those be and what does that look like? Well, you know, you're, you're dealing with an enterprise which started off with propaganda and with information. I mean, you look at the first Zionist Congresses, we're talking about 1897. There was already careful thought about how to say what had to be said to push this project forward. So we've had 130 or so years of careful thought about that narrative. And it is linked to the Bible, which is one of the most powerful documents in you know, most Western countries. And so it has, it's a narrative that has enormous potency. 
you don't just go up against that with slogans. You have to be informed. You have to know not only what you want to say or what narrative you want to put forward, but how to deal with the other narratives or na narrative or narratives that are out there. It's not, obviously, it's not an easy task. And I'm not saying you can do this easily and quickly. You can't. But the, at the very least, you have to inform yourself. I mean, if you're a Palestinian who's arrived from, say, Ramallah, where you never heard any argument against you know, the Palestinian narrative, it's, I, I, it's an enormous shock. Um, and you have to arm yourself. And the only way to arm yourself is to inform yourself. And that I mean, that's a hard slog. You just cannot go out there and say, you know, just mouth slogans. That won't work. Um, there's a very sophisticated narrative, um, like all sophisticated narratives that has, you know, elements of truth in it. Uh, you know, the, the degree to which Zionism is a result of persecution. There is the degree to which uh, Zionism is rooted in, in Jewish peoplehood. The degree, to, I mean, there are all of these things that you have to understand or you can't argue against them. So it's not just you have to understand your own narrative or your own history. You have to understand how that's intertwined with global history, with European history, with you know, Jewish history. If you don't understand that, you can't argue. I mean, there's no point. You just, you just, you will fail to convince people who are, who are convincible. Um, and that's not an easy thing. I mean, you know, I, I remember listening to people of my father's generation who were, you know, immigrants to this country or people who were students in this country. They had such a hard time because they were going up against a well-established, you know, finely chiseled narrative. And they just didn't have the tools. The, the, the tools exist today. I mean, there are films, there are novels, there is poetry in English. There are multiple histories. There are multiple analyses in politics and so on and so forth. And I'm not saying you can read all of that or watch all of that or, or, or absorb all of that information quickly, but you have to do some of it if you, if you really want to be effective. You know, if you just want to go out and say, you know, I'm the most militant person on earth, that's not going to get any, anybody anywhere. If you really want to be effective, you have to learn your own national narrative. You have to learn other narratives. Yeah, so that leads us nice into this next question. And so I think we're all, uh, and for those of us who have been in this for a while, we've known this, but I think the arc is starting to move towards most, more people in the United States and in Western European countries are starting to realize that we are complicit in the violence that's occurring in Gaza and the West Bank, as well as decades of unwavering support for the apartheid government of Israel over gosh knows, 100 plus years. Um, something that I don't think is as clear to people, especially here in the United States, is that, um, you know, for every one Jewish Zionist, I would argue, and people like Stephen Sizer would argue that there's probably 20 to 30 Christian Zionists. And so I think that uh, a lot of people don't recognize that the Israeli government has really come to rely on this constant and unwavering support of Christian Zionists here in the United States specifically. And so Christian Zionism in and of itself is an end of times Christian doctrine that asserts you know, the necessity of a Jewish state to be there in order for the Messiah to return, then only for the Jews to be left behind. Um, and so it in itself is inherently anti-Jewish yet, uh, you know, uh, Zionists and Netanyahu and U.S. presidents from, you know, decades back, well before I was born, um, you know, they biblicize um, all of this, which you mentioned early or on, and they especially tend to draw on this dangerous rhetoric of Amalek to, to defend Israel's right to defend itself. So I'm interested in hearing from both of you your thoughts on the distinction between faith practice religious identity, and then the Zionist movement. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big topic uh, that you just thrown at, thrown at us. Um, it, it's, it's always been um, the case, actually, that Christian Zionism and a kind of philo-Semitism existed independently of actual political Zionism. You can go back to England in the early 19th century when you had a revival, a Protestant religious revival, 
very much centered around the reading of the of the Bible that you just mentioned, that the, the return of the Jewish people is essential for the coming of the Messiah. And you have guys like Lord Shaftesbury, who are very influential in England, saying we have to help return the Jewish people for our own Christian purposes. That's always been there. That, and that that's there even before you have modern political Zionism. And it's gotten much more important in this country in particular. Um, it's a staple of the Republican Party right now, appealing to people who have those views for a variety of reasons, not just because of Palestine, in fact, not mainly because of Palestine, um, has become you know, central to the Republican Party. Um, so you have one political party which is in that camp, largely, I would argue, as far as Israel is concerned, because of Christian Zionism. Um, and it's, it's a real... It's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it, it, I'm not Christian. I'm not, you know, a believer in, in, in that eschatology, which, which talks about those things. And so it's very hard for me to talk at it or about it. And in fact, I've rarely encounter, encountered people who have those beliefs, but it is really a very important part of the American political system's unwavering support for Israel. Probably more important now, I would argue politically, um, than support of any any other group in this in our society, um, you know the Democratic Party is riven by differences over this, and it is over Palestine, um, not the Republican Party, and it is largely because of Christian Zionism. Yeah, I find. I mean, I as an anti-Zionist Jew, I find Zionism deeply anti-Semitic, and this is one of many reasons why, but Zionism embraces people who want us to die and be left behind, to burn in hell forever, and these are the bedfellows that they have made um, to carry out their settler, you know, project. Um, I uh, and this is, we were talking a little bit about the election beforehand. I know we've gotten a lot of questions from like audience members about the election. This is just why I am really nervous about, um, you know, people. In, first of all, people are saying they'd rather have Trump because like a genocide didn't happen under Trump. So maybe he'd be better for Palestine. First of all, if you look at what he's saying right now, he's trying to run to the right of Biden. He's saying, I wouldn't let humanitarian aid in. He's saying, I would deport anyone protesting for Palestine, who's not a citizen. Like he's he's definitely trying to be more hardline than Biden. I think if he could have gotten away with you know this during his presidency, he would have been all gung-ho for for genocide um, because he knows that his base is evangelical Christian. So I would just, I do not think that that I am horrified by Biden and how he's behaved over the last two months, but I don't think Trump is like a better alternative. I don't think there's a, a currently a good viable alternative, maybe one will emerge um, that, you know, but just that's one caution. <laughs> Republicans are not um, going to be an ally to Palestine. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it, being an anti-Zionist Jew in this moment, you were talking about, like the question was about like faith identity and separating that out. Um, I, I'm, it's been very encouraging this I mean, seeing the mass demonstrations of Jewish Voice for Peace in New York and shutting down bridges and shutting down the Statue of Liberty and all these things. Um, it's incredibly uh, inspiring. It's been really nice to, to not be the only anti-Zionist Jew talking about it uh, over the last few months. There's some great, uh, Katie and Shlomo and Isabella and you know, there's um, a bunch of us on TikTok and Instagram who are, uh, you know, putting that out there. And I just think it's really the responsibility of U.S. Jews to reclaim our identity from Zionism. <laughs> like it's been so they've had such a stranglehold. They have still still have such a stranglehold over our institutions. And I think the majority of U.S. Jews are still, you know, um in that headspace, but I think we're making massive headway. And, and I do feel uh, hope this time around thinking about, cause I've, I've been outspoken about anti-Zionism on the internet um, since, at least since 2021. And this is definitely like the most uh, outspoken. Of course, it's horrifying that it would, took massive deaths to make this much attention and have this many people speak out. It's such a shame. It's just, I just, I'm constantly, aching that we couldn't have had this kind of attention during the March of Return, you know, which was such a powerful moment. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, 
uh, Zionism is not Judaism. <laughs> if anyone needs to hear that, uh, you know, and there's many, many Jews and there's an increasing number of Jews who feel comfortable speaking out, uh, saying that, that Zionism is not Judaism and Zionism is in fact anti-Jewish. And, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of hard work for Jews to do, especially like with Jews, like within their own congregations, because there are, you know, religious Jews who are part of these institutions that are just tiptoeing or equivocating, you know, claim Jewish, Jewish organizations that are like social justice focused organizations that have said absolutely nothing about Palestine. And that just can't hold that. That's not sustainable. They can't keep doing that. Everyone sees that this is a sham. So um, I think we have we have all that work cut out for us. <clears throat> yeah, I think that, you know, I, as someone who identifies as Christian, I tend uh, to be on the side of, you know, we really need to remember, you know, where where Jesus for us, where that person is from, where their story happened, where they came from. And I think a lot of people uh, tend to forget that, you know, within the Palestinian Christian community, who arguably are the, the very first Christians, they are there, they are, they are still there. And so I think that uh, as much as I hear the work needs to be done within the Jewish community in the U.S., um, I personally, as a person of Christian faith, I feel like in this iteration, <laughs> in this country, uh, we gotta, we gotta be loud and we gotta be out there. And so, um, you know, I think in other things that, that I do, I, I, I lead a seminar to help preachers and young pastors learn how to preach from Palestine from the pulpit. And so I think that the more we can really ingrain this into the every, the, the worship moment within the Christian church in the United States, uh, we really need to do that. So, um, but yeah, it's a huge question. And obviously this is something that uh, it's going to take a mass movement um, of many different people from many different backgrounds here to, to sh really swing the pendulum. Um, so that, that gets us to, um, you know, uh, Palestinian cultural heritage. And so something that uh, was written in the book in multiple places, kind of a vain tapestry throughout the whole thing was um, the 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 preciousness of Palestinians' uh, libraries, whether they be personal libraries or um, you know libraries that were open to the public. Um, and it's also speaking of movies that you can watch. It's also discussed in the documentary film The Great Book Robbery by Benny Brunner who um, the, the lens for that came out of an Israeli PhD student named Geet, um, who really shone the light on uh, the proof within Israeli documentation of for the 48 um, of a state sanctioned looting of coming in behind the soldiers and um, taking, uh, seizing, stealing, uh, the books of Palestinian people that were left as they had to flee violence. And um, now they're held within the uh, Israel National Library in a collection that's called AP or Abandoned Property and are under the guardianship of something called the custodian of absentee property, as if people just like, you know, went on vacation and, and left their things Um and so Israeli historian Ilan Pape has stated that this seizing of Palestinian literature was done in order to defeat the Palestinian narrative and to try and erase Palestine out of history. Um, and in the words of a Palestinian writer named Allah Halel, like, great, you kept the book safe. Um, we're going to thank you over a coffee, but like, give us our books back. Um, so I. Uh, Let's talk a bit about the importance of cultural heritage and, and the necessity of Palestinian people to like have and have access to their own, uh, you know, literary assets, both present and past. Well, this is this is part of what a very fine anthropologist, I'm going to use a big word here, called epistemicide, trying to destroy any memory, any sign of a of a of a indigenous population that is being 
extirpated or eliminated or pushed out. Uh, we see it in this country. Um, we see it in Ireland. Uh, it's a wonderful play by Brian Friel called Translations about how English surveyors were changing the names of Irish the villages and roads and mountains and streams and so on and so forth. And it happened in Palestine, uh, both through the seizure of property, the kind of things that, that you're talking about, the seizure of libraries, uh, the seizure of books, uh, but also the through the renaming of everything, uh, and it is a it is a it's a feature of settler colonialism. Um, you you replace um, in our case Native American names with English names, um, and in in uh, in Palestine it took place through the replacement of Arabic names, ancient Arabic names, which sometimes were based on earlier names with new Hebrew names. Um, and it is, it is part of a destruction of memory, a destruction of, of, of the sort of cultural landscape of a place and its replacement with an entirely new one. Um, and and it's, a, it's a particularly pernicious process because it can be described as, you know, what we're saving these things, you know, they were abandoned. Um, and, you know, that's the rhetoric uh, behind this. They were abandoned because their owners were driven out and not allowed to return and their property was stolen, but that's all, that's all elided. That's all sort of, you know. And, and if, cultural preservation is one of the things that Palestinians try to do um, in those areas and in those spheres where they're able to do it, whether it's through preservation of literature or, or, or protection of libraries or building institutions that can do that, or it's through architectural you know, restoration and renovation. Um, and it's constantly subject to destruction. Um, an important fourth century, I believe, church in Gaza was the target of an attack uh, earlier on in this war. Uh, many other sites uh, are probably in danger today. Khan Yunus is a Mamluk, there's a Mamluk structure at the center of the city of Khan Yunus, which is under attack as we speak. And I have no idea what's going to happen to it, but I would be very surprised if it weren't at least damaged as part of this war where everything is a target. Um, so, uh, th this operates on multiple levels, um, and it's it's a very insidious process, a very pernicious process, hard to see, and it is you know it 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 can be described in a sort of neutral manner or even a positive manner, but it is a it is it is part of what settler colonialism does. You're 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 transforming a country from having a certain nature to having an entirely different nature, changing its population and changing the names and removing the cultural artifacts of the indigenous population. I mean, we, we can see it in, in this country if we look carefully. It's been happening for centuries here. Well, and I think that it, that commonality might be why Book Talk has embraced reading about Palestine. I think that like there are some people like earlier this year, as you mentioned in my bio, we did a trans rights readathon because of the massive you know, hundreds of bills that have spread across the country trying to attack trans rights and 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 the book bans trying to erase LGBTQ literature from our schools and libraries and bookstores and everything. Um, and, you know, the book community online really mobilized around that. And many of them, I don't think all of them, but many of them from that experience in March, like see the same sort of erasure happening. And these are people who decided to, you know, use their book presence online to commit themselves to social justice and to like fighting against fascism. And they see the commonalities um, from the US and Palestine. So I think that that, um, that commonality is, is like a place that, that we can get people to, to connect. Um, you know, it's, it's always like a shame to me that the like it, it feels weird that like the destruction of cultural artifacts can can seem to carry more weight for some people than the destruction of human lives. Um, but it, you know, I think seeing the bombed library uh, in Gaza, like I think it was last week, there was a library that was bombed and seeing all the books destroyed. Um, it's just, it's horrifying because it's that destruction of an entire culture and, and of memory and, um, you know, I think anyone who who cares about books and learning and education will will respond to that um, and 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 want to do something about it. And, you know, I think that's that's one reason why at least 
the social justice oriented side of the book online community. This talk is called Author Meets Book Talk, right? So like not all of book talk is talking about Palestine. There's definitely a lot of people still just reading Fourth Wing and talking about that and Colleen Hoover. But there's, you know, there's a lot, a lot of them who are picking up this book and others and Adania Shibley's minor detail and, um, you know, making those type, types of books go viral, which is not what book talk has a reputation for so yeah um yeah and i think these conversations you know having the conversation with people um whether that be through reading or um you know one on one dialogue or whatever that might be is super important um and i know we've had a lot of energy around a specific question that sim maybe you can talk to is like how, what are some good tactic and strategies for like having that conversation with ardent Zionists? Like, um, you know, in my context, uh, it's really important to try and have that conversation without people going on the defensive because the moment someone goes on the defensive, they are shutting down to listening to anything. But um, a lot of people are curious, how do you have those conversations with Zionists in your life? Um, I've not been very successful. I'm not the right person. Daniel Mate on uh, Instagram is much better that he like talks to to Zionists and like sometimes wins them over. And he's got that skill set, which I don't. You know, I um I have lost the people in my life that were Zionists. We're no longer like having a relationship that is functional anymore. Um over this. Uh, so I, I tried and we, it's very, very, very difficult. I actually was, so, so I know I don't have that skill set. Um, I've never had that skill set. So I'm more focused on, um, getting to the neutral people and the uninvolved people. And I'm not sure, or I feel like this is yucky, but I don't know if I'm allowed to speak out. Like there's huge numbers of those people. And I think I'm just personally much more effective at like targeting them and encouraging them to learn more and find the courage to speak out um, rather than the people who are dyed in the wool, deeply invested Zionists, because that is like a different skill set to talk to those people. And I don't have the, I don't have that skill set. <laughs> um, and I think uh, Savannah B Banana has a, a is a copywriter on uh, TikTok and Instagram and does like marketing, like videos, like, cause she has a mic marketing background and she talks about like how to, um, like she did a series on like how you sell a genocide, basically like exposing how they're using these like marketing tools to convince, you know, to build consensus for um, genocide, like the Western media. And she just, talks about how marketing companies, at least they just focus on like the neutral people winning them over. They don't, they never focus on like the hard line opposition. You just have to win over like that neutral wedge. So I've been thinking about it that way. So I'm yeah. sorry, I don't, I don't think I'm very good at it. It's very, very hard. I mean, I, I guess in my, my personal life, I don't frequently have those kinds of interactions, but as a teacher, and as someone who lectures um, all over the place, I do get, um, I do have lots of interactions with people who are very committed scientists. And I mean, I, I would go back to what I said uh, about how uh, as an activist, you should, you should try and function effectively. And that is to be as, as well informed as you can be and to, you know, try and puncture some of these myths. I find that as you go up the age pyramid, it gets harder and harder. I mean, people of my generation and two generations are generation below me. I almost don't try anymore. Um, with younger people, it is easier to be frank. I mean, there are very many committed Zionists among you know, younger people, obviously, but somehow I find them more amenable to at least listening to the possibility or being willing to admit the possibility of another narrative. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I don't think that for people who are older and very committed and who are, you know, locked into a narrative where the Holocaust and the, the, the degree to which there was a need for a refuge for persecution and the idea that Israel was 
was threatened with extinction and annihilation in 1967. The people who grew up, you know, with uh, this awful movie, Exodus. Uh, and you, when I ask an audience of older people, how many of you have seen the movie or read the book, you know, half the hands shoot up. That's what they think is reality. And you're not going to probably change people of that generation who have that mindset, you know. But younger people for whom Israel is this Goliath, um, that, that you may have been shaken by what happened since October 7th, but for whom Israel is this enormously powerful country, which is not in any great danger, and who, for whom the Holocaust is something at a distant remove, um, I found that it's a little easier to, 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 to talk to them. I think that a lot of what's going on now is reinforcing um, fears and deep-seated traumas that the older generation carried with it and which weren't as prevalent among younger people. And a lot of what we're hearing now is, you know, you are in danger everywhere. And the, 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 some of what's being said about anti-Semitism, some of what's being said about October 7th, um, to my way of thinking, is meant to restore a kind of primal fear that drives people towards Zionism and towards Israel. Um, and as with all of these things, I mean, there's an element of truth. You know, if you, if you, especially for people for whom having been taught about the Holocaust and pogroms and so on and so forth is part of the way they see the world, it's easy to trigger those things. And those are real things for them. Those are feelings, but they're real feelings. Um, to some extent, it's pretty clear how that's, I would love to hear Savannah Bananas uh, uh, reading of the of the of the ways that are used to sell some of these things, because um, some of it I think is very slick and very shrewd, and some of it is very ham handed and so obvious that anybody can see it should be able to see through it. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that um, you know there are so many people for a myriad of reasons. Um, they are. They're where they are physically located. And, you know, we often hear this narrative of how important it is to go to Palestine and see, to, to go and witness and see for yourself. And for a lot of people, uh, there's a barrier to access there to, to get there for um, many reasons. And so I know for myself, having gone and witnessed on multiple occasions, you know, you come back from that and I personally was not able to go on living my life the way I had before visiting and something had to shift um, because once you go and witness that, uh, it's very hard to come back um, and be the same person and live the same life. Um, and so uh, because of that, you know, reading as, you know, I think Semi brought this up earlier in our conversation, but um, like how, what are the ways in which reading can really help transport people into the reality, um, of somebody who lives really far away when they themselves can't physically go and witness and experience it in firsthand? Yeah, this is why I recommend reading fiction um, so much as well about Palestine, not just the uh, the nonfiction, because it does kind of put you in their shoes. And I think arguably you are far more equipped to speak on Palestine if you've read like one of Susan Abulawa's novels versus you went on a birthright trip when you were 17 and you saw a carefully curated you know, propaganda tour of Israel that Israel wanted you to see. And this claim that like, oh, you're not allowed to speak on Zionism because of whatever, or, or on, um, you know, Israel because of whatever, is, is such a common tactic in like the my comments, you know, like I'm not allowed to speak because I'm white. You're not allowed to speak because you're queer. Because how dare you? Because because of the whole pink washing narrative. Um, you're not allowed to speak because you've never been there. You know, talk to me when you've been there you don't have to travel to a place where genocide is happening to like be able to call it out when you're seeing it on your phone. Thanks to like, you know, these incredible um, journalists like Plesti and Bisan and Motez who have been documenting this whole thing um, in English for us so that we can understand what's happening. Um, and so I think that, you know, that first of all, like try to ignore those <laughs> Um, the people who tell you, you need to be silent because you don't have enough experience or whatever. Um, I think that that is uh, a silencing tactic that only benefits, 
um, the oppressors. I think that the idea also that you need to travel to learn about the world rather than through reading is sort of a very colonialist construction in and of itself. Most of popular travel destinations are deeply problematic because of, you know, uh, the tourism industry and, and money relationships. So the idea that you have to be somewhere to learn about it and know about it and be allies to the people there is, is not accurate. Um, and yeah, and I think that just reading fiction, you are putting yourself into a character's mind. You know, that author is showing you their thoughts and their experiences and their emotions. And it's a, it can be a really deep, powerful, um, transformative experience. And, uh, it can, can be far more powerful than some sort of touristy trip um, that was organized for propaganda like birthright. So, um, I mean, I, I can only agree with everything Sim just said. Um, first of all, and, and also something that Dee said, uh, if you can go, it can be transformative. Uh, everybody I know who went uh, neutral or, you know, semi-sympathetic, came back just uh, shaken, not just because of what they saw, but because of the realization that we are enabling, we, the United States, we taxpayers, our bombs, our guns, our planes are enabling us. But most people can't go. And that's understandable and reasonable. And you're absolutely right. Sim, this is it's a sort of colonialist trope. You know, you put on your pith helmet, you, you visit the natives. No, no, that's not that's not necessary. And I agree with you completely. Literature is the best avenue into this. I mean, and there's so many great authors, Adani Shibli, Tisama, Azam, Sorad Ami, all of these people writing novels that are, you know, reflections of Palestinian reality. Or go back and read the Vesan Kanafani's novels or Mahmoud Darwish's poetry. I mean, it puts you in the head of the people who are there in a way that you can't get even sometimes when you visit. Um, so in a way, literature is better uh, even than, you know, firsthand experience, or at least it supplements it in a way that's, that's, that's richer in some ways. Um, and that stuff is available, thank heavens, today. It wasn't 20, 30 years ago, but uh, uh, there are new novelists and poets, Hamid uh, Khut, Mosab Abu Toha, being published today, nobody ever heard of, uh, and their and their their stuff is really you know it will it will touch you if you have any any you know heart in you, um, and so I, I I couldn't agree more. It's the it's the best way, in my view, it, and I agree again with Sim. It's better than 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 nonfiction in certain ways. You know, you can just plow through so much history, and you can just plow through so much you know social science uh, before you fall asleep. Uh, so little of it is well written. So little of it is, is you know, accessible to people who are not experts. It's not meant to be, unfortunately. Our academic system, you know, privileges and, and, and values, stuff that's not accessible. Um, so literature is, to my way of thinking, the key. A couple of people in the chat asked for recommendations, so I'm just going to hold up some. A lot of Booktop is, is reading Adania Shibley's book because she was um, her, stripped of her award ceremony at the Frankfurt Book Festival. Um, so I haven't read it yet, but I picked that up. I'm reading right now Kool-Aids, which is this is by a Lebanese author because I didn't know anything about the Lebanese Civil War at all or the Siege of Beirut until reading your book. So I wanted to read something by a Lebanese author about that. And this is like about it's like half of the storyline is talking about the AIDS pandemic and then half is talking about in Beirut and I think this is such an important book for countering the like there's no queer you know Muslim people or there's no queer you know Palestinian or Lebanese people um so I'm reading that this mention, book, mention the author uh Rabbi oh, Alamedin yeah yeah Rabbi Alamedin uh uh and it's a contemporary even though it's like set in the 80s it's and then it's um it came, came out a few years ago and then, then Against the Loveless World by Susan Abulawa is like so powerful. It's from the perspective of a um, inmate. She's detained for life in solitary confinement in an Israeli prison. And it's her memoirs and her telling the story of how she became radicalized. Um, and Susan also wrote Mornings in Janine. Um, Salt Houses by Hala Alian 
is a multi-generational family epic um, showing how like the legacy of the Nakba and the War of 1967 like ripples through this family for generations as they're spreading throughout the diaspora. And then everything that Raja Shahada writes, his memoirs are like incredibly beautiful. But as like an environmentalist, I was really moved by Palestinian walks because it's a hiking memoir. It's telling the story of Palestine through six hikes he takes, ten, you know, each, um, you know, over the course of a couple decades and how the landscape is being transformed and polluted and destroyed by uh, settlers. So he has a new he has a new book, which is also fab, fabulous. I have it, what is it called? Oh my God, I have it outside. I'll get okay. it. I'll get it while you're talking. <laughs> all right. So yeah, uh, just all, the, all of those. I also recommend not a Palestinian author, but I recommend if you if you start reading um, Rashid's book and it's and it's really dense and you feel like you need a little bit an easier access point. Um, I, I always recommend Joe Sacco's Palestine. He's he's a U.S. journalist and he went and he made a graphic novel about Palestine. So you read it in a couple hours because it's comics, you know, but it has a ton of uh, good history in it. And that was actually the book that broke through my Zionism. Like I, I picked up that book and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> everything's different now. Um, I think that book should be recognized alongside Mouse, you know, it's like some of the greatest gr historical graphic novels ever written. So uh, I've, I know it's been hard to get a hold of because it's been like selling out everywhere, but I think it's back in stock places. Yeah, no, reading. I got it. Oh, Trantor. Oh. We could have been friends. Oh, and yes. Yes, my was... father. It's a one, it's an amazing, yeah. it's, a, it's an autobiographical story about how he never understood his father. And he came to, when he finally looked at his father's papers, he came to realize what a hero the man had been. But it, it tells you the history of some things nobody knows about, including me, and I'm a historian through this autobiographical tale. It's an amazing book. I mean, I love his work. I think Palestinian Walks, the one that you mentioned, Sam, is in many ways his best because of exactly what you said. But maybe this is as good or better. Well, I will definitely check it out. And I want to check out your son. Your son's work. He's a playwright. That's right. Um, so that is, does he, I mean, does he write about the Palestinian? Yep. He has, yeah. a, he has a, a couple of really interesting plays. He he and Naomi Wallace did an adaptation of um, Hassan Kanafani's novel, Return to Haifa, uh, which was um, premiered in London and it's been shown a couple of other places. Um, it was supposed to be shown here, but the board of the theater uh, refused to allow them to stage it because they said Kanafani is a terrorist. Um, so there you are. Uh, he's also uh, uh, he's had, has a couple of other plays, Truth Serum Blues. Um, oh, yeah, here you go. This is my favorite part. A couple part. of his, couple of his plays about. are here. Oh, cool. Uh, these up. are some of his plays. So, you know, there's, there's theater, there's, uh, there's, there are films. I mean, we could talk about films until the cows come home. Great films by Palestinian filmmakers, May Must See. Um, so many, so many fantastic filmmakers. Um, and the stuff is not all political, but it'll tell you about Palestine in ways that are, you know, only, only, only film can do. I've actually seen people starting to excerpt some of those films and putting clips of it on TikTok and Instagram. I think that's really smart. The kind of doing with films, what I've been trying to do with your book, where it's like, some people are just not going to go out and do the whole thing, <laughs> but how can we like get this information out or inspire some people like, oh, you watched a little bit of this. Now I'm going to go because it came through your feed. Now I'm going to go watch the whole thing. Right. right, right. The, the, While we're the, doing the, books. The, the beauty of that is that there are no gatekeepers. You know, you can just have access to something on TikTok. You can have access to something on Instagram. You don't have to get, you know, access to the film. It's so much harder with something like theater because there are powerful gatekeepers. Yeah. It's an expensive thing to produce a movie. It's an expensive thing to produce a play. And the gatekeepers there can just shut you down. Yeah, the gatekeeping is real. And that, right before I get into that, I think my biggest one is Dina Mater's uh, What It Means to Be Palestinian, Stories of Palestinian Peoplehood. What I really like about this is that they're all in short, like, excerpts like two or three page witness accounts that you can 
you know, if you have five minutes, you can sit down and read one at a time. And so I really recommend that one. Um, but on to this, uh, people saying no to events that uh, center Palestine. Um, you know, most recently, uh, the Palestinian Festival for Literature uh, event that happened in New York City at the beginning of November, I think they went to six different venues before five, yeah, five different venues before the sixth one finally said yes, which was right. uh, my alma mater, um, UTS. And and I think that, um, you know, this this is here in the United States where we have this, especially in academia, um, what I call PEPs, progressive except for Palestine, you know, where we um, were, were really great at bringing forth a lot of other social justice issues and then it stops right there. Um, and so in kind of line with that, um, uh, like here in the United States, even with all of that, even with events being shut down, books being taken off the shelves that revolve around Palestinian lives, um, we have more access to that here than people in Palestine do to, you know, specifically getting hands on Arabic literature because, you know, the the Israeli governmental forces tend to seize books at the borders when they're trying to come in to populate collections and libraries. Um, and I think that, um, you know, a question that's been that's been trickling around multiple different spaces is, you know, we have the boycott, sanction, divestment movement as a whole. And now, um, yes, no boycotting of Israeli academic institutions and things that uplift and support that, like is that an effective um, use of time to, to boycott um, on the academic institutional level of, you know, as, you know, um, you know, Palestinian authors have had events canceled for them. They've had awards taken away. Um, sh should we start boycotting events and, and things that are happening, that are um, coming through from the Zionist uh, movement? Is that, there were a lot of questions around, is that something that we should we should do? I mean, I, I, I think that, Boycott, divestment, and sanctions as a general, you know, approach is a is very very fruitful in multiple ways. Not only or not necessarily even in order to have a the effect of, for example, having a university divest from companies that support the Israeli occupation, but as a mobilizing tool. Uh, I, I saw how students on Columbia campus and the Brown campus and the Michigan County innumerable campuses across the United States uh, successfully organized around this. And, and it was useful as an educating tool. It was useful as an organizing tool. Um, in no case that I know of did a university actually end up divesting. But that wasn't necessarily the point. The point was to embarrass the university into doing something anti-democratic and that large parts of the faculty, and in the case of Columbia and Barnard and Brown, overwhelming majorities of the student body wanted them to do. Okay we've revealed them for what they are. And that, that, that in and of itself is valuable. And people learned how to organize and people learned about Palestine and people entered into dialogues with other people who became politicized. So, I mean, to my way of thinking, it has enormous value in and of itself, irrespective of any results. Um, in addition to which it's just, I mean, you don't want us to use violence. Okay, can we go to the courts? No, you can't go to the courts. Oh, you're delegitimizing Israel. Okay, how about demonstrations? Oh, we'll shoot you down with snipers if you demonstrate, which is what happened to the Great March of Return, as, as Sim was saying. In 2021, over 200 people were murdered by Israeli snipers, unarmed demonstrators, and hundreds were disabled uh, by Israeli snipers shooting at their knees. That's what happens when you demonstrate. And if you do boycott, that, that's anti-Semitic. So no nonviolent means of resistance is acceptable. And of course, violence, we are terrorists. So the idea is stay in your box and shut up while we colonize this country. And you just have to break out of that. And I, I would say BDS is one of many ways to try and break out of that. It's a, it's a perfectly, it's as American as apple pie. You know, you would not have had desegregation if it weren't for boycott. You wouldn't have had the, what's one of the great tools of Irish liberation was boycott. It's an Irish 
it, it, it's from the Irish experience. Boycott was a captain uh, who was the agent for a lord who was a landlord in, in, in Ireland. And his tenants decided to boycott him. Captain boycott, that's where it comes from. So it's a, it's, it was a tool in South Africa, it was a tool in India. It's a, liber, it's a tool of liberation, boycott. And anybody who opposes it says, okay, you're in favor of segregation. You're in favor of colonialism. You're in favor of colonial settler regimes. That's fine. We know where you stand. And we stand on the other side. I, I, so as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a great, I think it has to be used discerningly. It has to be used discriminatingly. You have to think before you do anything. But uh, I, I think it. I think it's a. It's a perfectly legitimate uh, tool in the arsenal of any liberation uh, uh, project. Yeah, big, big, longtime BDS supporter here, and I think what you said is so important. Like every every activist movement is sowing the seeds for the next one, you know. And so BDS, like we would not have the amount of rapid response, you know, shutting, like I said, shutting down bridges and train stations and all of these things, the people that have organized these actions in the last two months have been engaged in organizing for Palestine for years. And a lot of them probably learned that and cut their teeth on BDS and some of them exactly. cut their teeth right before. And so, um, and everything that we're doing now, even, and that's why like, it's very easy to get disheartened in this moment because there are these massive, incredible, inspiring actions happening and thousands of people coming together to shut down, you know, commerce and all this stuff. And yet the, the government is, is very slow to turn policy is very slow to turn, but we are, like you said, exposing them and embarrassing them. And that it may take a long time. There's going to be a delayed reaction to that, but a lot of new people are cutting their teeth on <laughs> organizing for Palestine or becoming engaged in Palestine, like many, many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. And that will have ripple effects for generations. So I just want to speak to something that Sim just said, because I think it's really important. You have to have patience. It's, it's, hor it's horrific to tell people to have patience when you're seeing people being slaughtered, as is happening now in Gaza. But the 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 anti-apartheid movement in this country took ages before it could convince politicians. Ages. It took years and years and years and years of organizing and protesting. The anti-Vietnam War movement, the civil rights movement. Um, that is the way it is. It takes a long time before these powerful vested interests and these corrupt politicians finally respond to public opinion. It is not an easy thing, and and, and it takes you know. You got to stick to it, and it's going to take a while. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, but if you don't do it, it won't happen. And if you do do it, I'm, the examples I've given you, uh, the United States under Reagan did not want to cut loose apartheid South Africa. They were forced to by the pressure of the anti-apartheid movement. The United States government did not want to stop the war in Vietnam. It was forced to. The French government didn't want to stop the war in Algeria. I could give you examples forever. But those things really took time and a lot of organization and a lot of, you know, very, very hard work over time. And it's not so you don't just go on the streets and suddenly the government says, OK, we give up. We were wrong. We were evil. We're going to be good. No, that does not happen, unfortunately. Yeah, um, at the time, you know, the, the length I know in, in my own experience, even just within one small group of, of people uh, within this country in my denominational home within the Presbyterian church, it took, oh gosh, we're on to year 20, 2024 will be year 20 of IPMN. And it took decades of, of organization and leadership um, from people speaking on behalf of Palestinians, just for our church to call it what it is, and that it is indeed an apartheid uh, situation. Um, and I think that, you know, in this, uh, you know, attention economy that we have right now, and sometimes this attention, you know, instant gratification of, you know, wanting to get your hands on something right then, um, you know, these long drawn out things that happen over someone's lifespan sometimes it takes that long for things to shift and so really um you know i think uh, as organizers i think we 
in our fight for um, helping and supporting other people, we forget that we need to take time to care for ourselves as well in that process. So that way we're not getting burnt out. Um, you know, it's important to take, take a moment, <laughs> take a moment to yourself so that you can re-energize yourself to continue on for the long, the long haul. Um, and so just with a few more questions here, I know that um, a lot of people, you know, for, for instance, if the ceasefire happened right at this moment and the occupation ends tomorrow, um, what happens next? You know, what does it look like to have, what is necessary to happen to achieve, um, you know, a just sustainable future in which Palestinian people have the right to return and have reparations and are able to come back um, and be part of the infrastructure of governing their, you know, their country. And we've seen talk around, you know, two state solution and a one state solution. And, you know, there's varying opinions on all sides of that. But, but what happens next if if the ceasefire actually happens and the occupation ends right now, where do we go? What does it look like uh, from here? Yeah, um, I mean, this is the kind of question I usually dodge, uh, try to dodge <laughs> because I, I, but I, my, my stock answer is the job description of a historian doesn't include predicting the future. So, you know, I don't know. Um, the, I don't know the real answer to your question. And I think we're very far away from any of the things you're talking about, unfortunately, because they're very powerful obstacles to change in our government, in our political system, in the powers that be in our society that are very stacked against the change in the status quo, which is a status quo of supporting Israel in whatever it does. Um, that is changing. It's changing at the grassroots, it's changing at the base. I, I, I foresee a, a, a Democratic Party in three, four, five years that will actually represent what the majority view in that party is, which is much more supportive of Palestine and much less willing to put up with the outrages that Israel commits. It may take several years, it may take more than several years. I don't know how long it'll take, but that's happening. That will happen at the base. Um, we're getting churches, we're getting unions. The UAW has come out for ceasefire. The nurses union has come out for a ceasefire. Uh, the postal workers union. These are three of the most diverse, important unions in the United States. I would expect others will come out. The Democratic Party in Texas came out for a ceasefire. So there's change happening at the grassroots, on campuses, in unions, in churches, in synagogues, and you know, among young people in, in general. But it'll take a long time. And until the United States changes, you know, if you believe that this is a colonial settler project, we're the metropole. And you have to make change in the metropole for the change in the colony to take place. That's why changing what Reagan and Thatcher were trying to do with South Africa was so important to liberating South Africa. And that's why changing France was so important to liberating Algeria. If the French wanted to continue killing Algerians, they, Algeria would still be a French colony. Uh, so the, it's gonna take a while and we have a lot of work to do in this country, but there's a lot of work to be done in Israel. And there's a lot of work to be done in Palestine among the Palestinians. I mean, Palestinians need to develop a unified national movement. We don't have that right now. We have a, 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 a sordid mess. Uh, I, I don't want to talk in detail about Palestinian politics and bore you all to death, but that's a problem. It's a problem, obviously, which is partly a result of external meddling and trying to keep the Palestinians divided, but it's up to the Palestinians to overcome that. And that's a big ask. It's going to take a while. Um, there were times when the Palestinians were united historically, and this is one of the times when they're very disunited. And finally, you have to change attitudes in Israel. And you, any solution has to involve a way that these two peoples can live together. And that's not going to be easy because of nationalism, because of uh, anger, rage, hatred, uh, propaganda, all kinds of things. Uh, the solution has to be a decolonial sol solution. And decolonizing is not easy. The Irish still haven't finished with it. I don't think South Africa's finished with it, frankly. We, I mean, we haven't finished with it. So. God knows, we haven't even started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those guys, those countries are far, much farther down the path than the United States or Canada or, or Australia or New Zealand, the white settler colonies. Um, and and we're, we're, I think that, that, that talking about a, 
two state or a, a confederal or one state solution is a little bit premature. That's why I stayed away from that in this book. I said, you know, just have whatever solution you have has to be based on equity and justice. I would add, and, and decolonization, I mean, breaking down the structures of mind as well as the physical and, and, and you know, institutional structures that keep one group superior to and oppressing another group, which is what colonialism is all about, um, which is what Israel is all about. I mean, you, you can talk about it as, as colonial, you can talk about it as apartheid, you can talk about it as Jim Crow or segregation. You can, there are multiple ways to see it. It involves all of those things. And those structures have to be broken down. And that's not an easy thing to do. When you're in a situation of privilege and you're benefiting from those structures, you're gonna give something up and that's not an easy thing to do to get people to accept that. Um, very, very hard thing to do. Yeah, I'm, I also dodged this question because I'm, well, I'm an anarchist, so I don't like states. I actually, I wrote somewhere, you were talking about the arbitrariness of like all nation states in the conclusion. And I wrote fuck states in the corner. <laughs> when you said like the, the arbitrary nature of all national entities is self-evident to those who have studied its genesis in myriad different circumstances. So like, yeah, I mean, one state, two state, I don't want any states, but, um, but a, a two state solution is particularly worse, like in my opinion, because that means the preservation of a Jewish ethno, of a religious ethno state. And that to me is always going to be worse. A country where people of a certain religion have more rights and more privileges um, than people of another religion, that's worse than a liberal democracy, which is still not great. But um, I think that, you know, that I'll say that, I'll say, I think that's worse. I don't think that, um, you know, apparently, according to Congress, this is now deeply anti-Semitic of me to say, but I don't think Israel should continue to exist because I don't think countries should exist where one religion has more rights than people of another religion in that country. Um, so I would I would not like to see that. Um, and I think that that, you know, I, I think that's the limit of that. Like people are like saying, like, oh, vote for Marianne Williamson. But she just came out saying, oh, we're talking about a two state solution. You know, this is like like she's basically representing like a return to Obama era um, politics towards Israel, which was already very extremely one sided towards Israel and benefited Israel. So, um, yeah, I, I like I'm, I mean, people ask me this, this question all the time and I'm like, I'm just I'm just on TikTok. I'm just I'm just telling you to read books like you shouldn't look to me to solve Israel, Palestine, and I can't for you. Um, Khalidi would be much more equipped to do that. <laughs> and he's obviously, you know, also not, you know, no one person can answer this question. But I do believe, uh, which I think was affirmed by the conclusion of your book, is this, this idea that changing narratives can change the world, changing narratives can change history. And so that is where I know that I can focus because that's my living is, you know, stories. So we have to change the stories we tell. We have to be telling stories that have been silenced for a hundred years and sharing those. And um, by doing that, we can shift things, you know, in ways that are inconceivable, like ending slavery in the U.S. at one time seemed inconceivable, ending segregation, gay rights, like things can change massively. Um, and it really does take massive shifts in public consciousness. Yeah, um, in our concluding time here, I'm just on a personal level, I'm curious um, if there is one major takeaway that the average person um, who's watching right now who might not be somebody who is, you know, academically um, educated on this or doesn't have a lot of experience or is new to these conversations, what is the one one thing i know there's many things that people should be doing but what is the the one thing that is um that someone can incorporate into their lives and i think i'll just offer one since i'm asking this question um i think i have the five calls app downloaded on my phone um and i every single day i wake up in the morning and i call my representatives it takes five minutes to call all of them 
And now there is a, a fax option that we have online uh, where you can fax your representatives every single day as well. Um, and I think those are easy lifts that people can incorporate into their life right now and do every single day. So those are mine. Um, what 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 are the what's the one or smallish number of things that people can be doing now to help to enact change and keep the momentum that this moment has created going in the long run? I, 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 go, go ahead. I, I wouldn't be prescriptive about it. I would just say like, cause it's gonna be different for everybody. What's like the most useful for you to do and what's the most doable for you to do. Um, so I would just say like, try to do one little thing every day. You know what I mean? Like that's sustainable for you. If you're an artist, make art about it, you know, <laughs> and like, can you do something, you know, what is your skill set? Like me, I'm, uh, Clearly, I, you know, resonate on TikTok. So I'm putting a lot of energy in that. And I, I feel guilty sometimes I'm not showing up to all the actions that are in my city. Um, but right now, because of very like various medical things, I'm not like the most physically able to like be standing out at a protest for like three hours. Um, so I just feel like my time and energy is better spent reading books and summarizing them on TikTok, which is maybe like not, you know, um, that's where I'm making the biggest impact. Right. And so like, where can you make the biggest impact and what is also sustainable for you? Um, people have disabilities. Not everybody can be out in the streets. If you can be out in the streets, um, also like people of different immigrant status, like what you can risk based on your privilege level is different. Like what your bandwidth is, whether you have kids that you have to pick up from school at the time things are happening is different, you know? So I think, I think calling your representatives is great. I think, social media is actually really important and just like posting even like to your like, like to your Facebook like just like posting your Facebook that you're concerned about what's happening in Gaza and you want to see a ceasefire like I think that's really powerful especially if you're someone who doesn't usually talk about politics and you don't usually you know use your social media presence in that way I think that's really powerful just for like ordinary everyday people to be like hey I'm, I'm really upset about this issue um so yeah whatever it is just do something small and sustainable and, and, and do make time to rest and look away from Instagram and, you know, live your life so that you can sustain yourself and, and commit to this long-term and have patience. Like Holly said. Yeah. I mean, I just, I agree with everything every, both of you have said. Um, I was really surprised to read a news item that said that calls to uh, uh, members of Congress are going very heavily in favor of a ceasefire and that the staffers are just shocked in many cases are not even able to tell their representative because the representative doesn't want to hear it. But I still think it, 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 it shows up, it, it has an impact. And I think demos have an impact too. I mean, I really think that some of the things that have been done just here in New York City where I live have had a enormous impact on liberating people and making them realize, hey, I'm not alone in, in having these views. There are tons of people out there. Um, and especially some of the smarter uh, actions like the Brooklyn Bridge, like the uh, Statue of Liberty, like the Grand Central actions, were just so well thought out and so well executed um, that they had exactly the impact everybody wanted. I guess the last thing I would say, besides what you said, Sim, take care of yourself, don't overdo it. And um, the idea of just trying to do something every day, if you can is to inform yourself. You know, you'll be more effective if you know more. You'll be more effective if you are if you have a broader view of things. Um, and, and, and when I say broader, I mean, learn all of the narratives, not just the Palestinian narrative, which has been so ignored. Learn other, other ones. There are other things that are important about this issue that you have to, that you have to attend to. But mainly, inform yourself about Palestine. I mean, uh, uh, Ignorance is a, is a terrible tool in the hands of tyrants and in the hands of oppressive systems. Uh, keeping people ignorant is essential to maintaining the status quo. And the degree to which we can illuminate and you know, educate um, will be more successful. Yeah. Um, oh, man. I, in our concluding moments here. I know a lot of people in the chat have been asking about resources and things online that you can access about Palestine. 
Um, and, you know, an ongoing conversation in the librarian world is that there are never enough free online courses about topics out there, especially when it comes to Palestine. So I am just going to say, if you're the person that wants to curate that kind of content, there's nobody that is stopping you from creating, you know, open access resources on Palestine. And to get you started with resources to educate yourself, if you are on the Librarians and Archivists with Palestine website, we do have a readings and resources list. It is by no means extensive um, and covers everything um, that there possibly is, but it's a really good place to get started with nonfiction, fiction, websites, um, activist organizations, uh, movies, uh, musicians um, that are all doing work related that are either Palestinian, Palestinians in the diaspora or people that are doing work related around that topic. So thank you. <laughs> thank you both so much for your, your time and your, your energy and you spirit today. Um, this has been uh, very generative for me. And um, I hope you both stay well as we move into moments past this and just thank everybody. Um, I know we reached capacity within the Zoom room really early on in the conversation. So everyone here on Zoom that's watching, everyone who's here on YouTube that is with us, and then anyone who will be watching this recording later, thank you for giving us your time and your hearts and your minds today. Um, so if, if you guys have any other concluding remarks, um, I, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Sam. Thank you, Rashid, for this conversation. It's just been, um, I feel energized to be able to continue forward um, that well, moment by much. hour and day. And thanks to librarians and archivists for setting this up. And obviously the Sam for bringing, Thank our, you. bringing it's their fun. audience to this. It's fabulous. It's fabulous. Well, it's been an honor talking with you. Thank you to librarians for setting this up and everyone for watching and learning and following along. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks. Thanks to everybody who sat in. I appreciate it. It's part of the change that's taking place. It's a good thing. Yes. Well, thank you all. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll... We'll go back to doing the work. So thank you all. Take care, everybody. Bye now.